coming in at number 10, we have Homo gontingensis. We are starting off with an ancestor that might have had a smaller brain than most of our other predecessors, but it seemed that this creature was quite resourceful. Homo gontingensis was a species that seemed to have the ability to use fire. It's unknown how it learned this skill, maybe it was passed down from generation to generation, like we do with driving or watching American Idol. The way that scientists are able to make this assumption is from charred bones that were found along with the fossils of Homo gontingensis. This means that this prehistoric man was cooking its meat before it ate it. Imagine you were the first guy to cook food. You bring a girl over for a date and you're like, hey, you want some charred meat? You are for sure getting a second date. However, it seems from this ancestor's teeth that meat wasn't often on the menu. They had large flat teeth, which are commonly associated with herbivores. It also seemed that Homo gontingensis lived mostly in trees and might have come down occasionally to hunt or forage for food, but outside of that, trees are where this creature loved to live. Coming in at number nine, we have Homo ergaster. Moving over to Africa now, there's a reason they call Africa the cradle of civilization. It seems that a lot of our ancestors have come from this place, and this is where a good chunk of of Homo ergaster's remains were found. Homo ergaster was a transitional ancestor. It seemed to have a weaker bone structure compared to similar species. This would mean that Homo ergaster had started moving into a lifestyle that was less dominated by physical conflict. There's also a lot of evidence that showed Homo ergaster had a more advanced system of social interaction. I mean, they weren't sharing K-pop songs together, but they were gathering in large groups. Who knows what they could have been doing back then? I think it was probably beatbox battling. That's just my highly educated scientific opinion. You you don't have to believe me, but I'm on part three of this series, so I think I would know. Coming in at number eight is Homo surprenensis. This extinct species is extremely interesting because there's so little known about it. Most of the time when a new species is discovered, there's a series of fossils that can be traced back to the same specimen. Sometimes there's even stone tools and evidence as to what their social system looked like. But with this guy, there's none of that. We don't have any info of this old school dude because the only thing that we found was just one skull. It was discovered back in 1994, and since then there has been no discoveries that could be linked back to this guy. It's a lone ranger. Now, how could a skull be found and there be nothing else? Well, there's a good chance that this bad boy was killed by something and then the skull was taken to another place and then just chucked on the ground after whatever was carrying it was done with it. It's kind of brutal, but back then skulls would have been ripped off of bodies all the time. It was the Stone Age, baby. People ripped your head off as a prank. Coming in at number seven, we have Homo sapien ildaltu. This might be one of our closest known ancestors that has died off. This dude was walking around 160 thousand years ago and in terms of life on this planet that's not that long ago they would have walked upright and it seemed that most of them lived in northern africa the remains of this ancestor were found in ethiopia it's unknown why this species wasn't able to make it into the future with us one of the fossils discovered had the best preserved skull of any extinct human species so we have been able to learn a lot about the size of this people's brain and their eating habits the brain was pretty close to the same size as our own and it seemed like most of our ancestors it fed primarily on a vegetarian diet. Coming in at number six, we have Kenwick Man. What makes the discovery of Kenwick Man so interesting is that he's not that old. Now, this means that he is most likely a direct descendant and not an extinct species, but I wanted to include him on the list because I thought it was super cool. Kenwick Man was found off the coast of the Kenwick River in Colombia and holds a lot of similarities to other Native American people. He has similar bone structure and it's thought that he could have very similar DNA as well. When he was found, some information about his death was very fascinating. He didn't die from a tiger attack or old age. He had a spear lodged in his hip. That's a good way to die. So that means competing tribes in the area were duking it out over rule of land way back then, before we were even drawing lines about which nations belong to which people. It really makes you think about how long we've been fighting for and how in some ways it's built into our DNA. Coming in at number five are Quadrilopithecus ramidus. These guys play a very important role in understanding where we come from. Better known as Artie, these are some of the oldest known fossils that can be related to humans. This dude was most likely still covered head to toe in hair like a chimp. Now we would think that is super gross, but back then it was quite stylish. You were warm and comfy all the time. It was like having a free Snuggie. They walked the earth about 4.5 million years ago in Northern Africa. It's thought that the largest grouping of them would be in present day Ethiopia. Now, why is Artie so important to knowing more about our genome? Well, because Artie was around at a pivotal moment in our development. 4.5 million years ago was when we were going through a transfer period, when we were going from walking around like an ape to sometimes on two legs. The question is, 
why did we change? Coming in at number four with Paranthorpus Boyasai. Now let's get a little closer to the modern age. Not that close though. This long lost ancestor was around 1.4 million years ago and was found throughout Northern Africa. It's thought that they could have been one of the most dominant versions of humanoid for nearly 1 million years. That's not that bad of a track record. Hopefully we can pull off something similar. Something quite interesting about this ancestor is the mouth, jaw, and teeth because they were freaking huge compared to a lot of other primates primates of that time. It's thought that they had a high fat diet that consisted of nuts and hard shells. That is how they got the nickname Nutcracker. This species would use its strong jaws to crack open nut cases that other creatures couldn't get to. Being able to get to high calorie foods might be why this ancestor was able to be so dominant for so long. Coming in at number 3 we have Stelahanthropus chidensis. Now we are going back in time. This species is a common ancestor for both chimpanzees and humans. It's estimated that this beast walked the earth about 7 million years ago and it was at this point where our two species split. It would have been two separate groups of primates breaking off that made our two separate species. I think we got the better deal out of this split. Now why did our species do so much better than chimpanzees? Well it could have been nutrition or crossbreeding with other ancient species, but the story is still yet to be told. Coming at number 2 is Australopithecus garhi. Alright we're nearly at number 1 and this guy has locked down the number 2 spot because A. garhi was the first known pre-homo species to use stone tools. That's absolutely incredible. It's thought that they were not primarily used for hunting or combat, but mostly for butchering meat that had already been killed. They most likely walked the earth 2.5 million years ago. They had huge jaws and heads, but brains that weren't much larger than any other Australopithecus that could have existed around that time. It seems that the females of these species were quite large, which could mean that the males and females were the same size. Coming in at number one is Australopithecus afarensis. Probably one of the best studied ancestors, the key to unlocking more knowledge about these dead species is fossils, and A. afarensis is one of the species that we have the most fossils of. Through modern discoveries, we have been able to determine that these males were much larger than the females, and there was most likely a constant battle for dominance between males. They competed for land and, and mates. The females most likely gathered foods for their prehistoric tribes. It's fascinating what we have been able to discover, and when I say we, I mean people much smarter than me who can pronounce big science words. I'm just the messenger who read a few things on the internet. Coming in at number 10, we have Boskop Man. Boskop Man sounds like a cool dude. Boskop is the nickname you give your buddy who's always late but brings a ton of snacks for everyone. He's like a little bit of a mess but a really cool guy. You're like, hey Boskop, what's up dude? But the Boskop Man that we're going to be talking about today was actually discovered in 1913 in Boskop, South Africa. Now there has been a little bit of controversy with this fossilized cool dude. At first everyone was in agreement that this discovery was the remains of an ancient human species that has long since died off. But Boskop man had a massive amount of cranial space. The skulleture chamber which held its brain was 30% larger than our own. Even though these dudes were prehistoric they had some big old brains. Look at the big brain on Boskop man. But decades later new evidence suggested that Boskop man was actually just an an ancestor of modern humans and wasn't a fallen species at all. Since then that has been the final consensus of Boskop Man's heritage, but if we want to go down the well of crazy conspiracy theories, some people think that Boskop Man's cranial space is evidence of alien human hybrids. Coming in at number 9 we have Neanderthals. Of all the ancestors that had a shot at being number 1 over us or even coexisting with us, Neanderthals probably had the best shot. Now just like every other ancient civilization or species, there has been a lot of debate as to where Neanderthals stand in the genetic lineup. Some say that they were a species of their own and others say that they were a subspecies of Homo sapien. What can be agreed upon is that it seems that we all had the same main ancestor which we evolved from about 800,000 years ago. There is also a lot of evidence that shows Neanderthals and humans interbred. There are some European people who have Neanderthal DNA, so in a way they live on in us and they make the people who have that DNA stronger and balder. Apparently Neanderthal DNA can make you sure shorter, stockier, stronger, and balder. So there is some good and some bad that comes along with it. Coming in at number 8 we have Homo antecessor. These guys are old as hell. They might have been the oldest Homo sapien species in Western Europe. They were around when the first stone tools were ever being used. They must have been the coolest dudes in town. You have a group of dudes with the first spear ever. That would be like the first guy walking on the sun. It's thought that these ancestors walked the earth about 1.2 million years ago. The real estate market must must have been amazing back then. You could probably get a beachside home for three rocks and a tiger tooth. Coming in at number seven is Homo luanzensis. This extinct human 
human ancestor has gone through a lot of changes over the years, and when I say changes, I mean what scientists have classified them as and whether or not they were even a race of people. Homo luanzensis was given the name Eubag Man by some, which coincides with the name of a mythical creature that was said to live in the same caves where this ancestor's remains were discovered. It was in the Philippines, and when the bones were first found, local people thought this would give proof to the legend. After close examination, these findings were connected to humans. They weren't an extinct species, but just some of the oldest remains of our ancestors that have ever been discovered. But everyone changed their minds again when more evidence came forward and showed that this species was actually an offshoot of humans and a dead pygmy species. Coming in at number six, we have Solo Man, Mr. Solo Dolo. No, I'm not gonna recite a Kid Cudi song right now, but I will let you know about this extinct human species. Solo Man was found in 1931 in Indonesia, and it wasn't too far from where another extinct species was found, Java Man. At first it was thought that they could have been the same species, but after closer examination, it was found that Solo Man had a much larger brain than Java Man, and certain findings suggested that Solo Man had one of the most advanced cultures of that era. They most likely existed in the same era as Homo sapiens, and they might have crossbred with them. I bet this ancestor's advanced culture leaked into our DNA, and that's how we were able to make the Fast and the Furious franchise. Coming in at number five, we have Homo rudigenensis. Now let's head over to Africa for this amazing discovery. The samples of Homo rudigenensis, who was first called the Broken Skull Man, were found in 1921. Now some people think this was just another version of Homo heidelbergensis. Other people state that this is actually a subspecies of Heidelberg Man. Final decision on where these guys line up on the genetic table is still unknown, but it can be agreed upon that they are all very dead. They most likely went extinct 100,000 years ago. I wonder what was the deciding factor that made it so our species could work through the fire and the flames and become the most powerful species on the planet and have others that were so close to us genetically, some with even bigger brains, not able to survive. I think it was our charming good looks. We were able to woo our way into the future. Coming in at number four, we have Peking Man. Now let's go over to China. Peking Man was discovered in Beijing. I'm surprised it took us this long to get over to China with these discoveries. Peking Man has a little bit of mystery in regards to its classification. The most commonly accepted stance is that it's an offshoot of Homo erectus and it was alive around 750,000 years ago. Where the remains were discovered, there was a series of tools. This suggested that this ancestor was quite intelligent and likely hunted with stone tools and used stone weaponry. Coming in at number three, we have Australopithecus africanus. Now let's shoot back over to Africa and go way back in time. We're shooting back in time almost four million years. It's thought that this ancestor was one of the first to start walking upright. The discovery was first thought to be that of some sort of ancient ape. There were a lot of similarities in the facial structure and the orbital bones, but there was something very different. The hole in the back of the head. The slot in which the spinal column slides into the skull so everything is connected and the brain can send signals down to the rest of your body. Now on primates, this opening comes in on an angle, but with humans, it comes in right from the bottom, meaning that A. africanus walked upright just like us. This could make this one of the oldest extinct human species ever. I would not want to deal with the monstrosities that this human had to deal with. Coming in at number two is Australopithecus sediba. This species might have existed alongside of Australopithecus africanus. The oldest dated discovery of this ancestor is two million years ago. This guy was wrestling down tigers before Tiger King even had the genetic code to be Tiger King. Because of the time period when this ancestor was walking the earth, it's thought that this could have been the species that evolved into the Homo genus. That is truly amazing. This species would have been the point of evolution where we started to become the people who we are today. We went from barely knowing how to use sticks to kill something to spreading K-pop all over the globe. We are truly amazing. Coming in at number one, we have Denny. Here's where things are gonna get a little bit crazy. What about hybrid humans when you mix up different species? I mean, we know that this has been happening. We still have people living today with ancient DNA in their bodies. Now, Denny, or Denisova 11, was the body of a 13-year-old girl that seemed to have a mix of two separate species. It's thought that she was a cross between Neanderthals and Denisovians. It would seem that somehow both of Denny's parents were not of the same species, and this brings up a lot of questions as to how these two separate tribes of humans interacted. Was it normal for cross breeding to take place or was this just a one-time deal? Perhaps both of her parents were excommunicated from their separate tribes and then ran into each other. Or were Denisovians and Neanderthals always hanging out and chilling and doing cool stuff? Coming in at number 10, we have Homo heidelbergensis, also known as Heidelberg Man. This extinct human ancestor walked the earth about 600,000 years ago in Africa, parts of Asia, and Europe. They are believed to be the direct ancestors of Neanderthals, and some archaeologists even argue that they are archaic or early Neanderthals. Heidelberg 
Berg man was an exceptionally tall ancient man. They hunted and butchered large prey and may be the first species of homo to intentionally bury their dead. I wonder what those funerals must have been like. It was like Glue Perp was a very fast runner, but he wasn't so fast that he didn't get mauled by a saber tooth tiger. And now let's move on before the same thing happens to all of us. At number nine, we have Homo rudolphinus. This extinct human ancestor is only known through a small number of fossil bone fragments. There have been some debate on whether or not Rudolphinus is the earliest known member of the Homo genius or is a very late member of the Australopithecus genius. Due to the scant nature of the remains, not much is known about the species, but evidence suggests that the brains were proportionately larger than the other earliest members of the Homo genius. These guys were huge eggheads. No wonder they didn't make it for a very long time. I don't think nerds would have fared well before laws were invented. Well, they did have laws back then. It was just who could punchy punch the bestie best. Next up at number eight is Java Man. This early human was actually made up of 80% coffee and that's how it got its name and the reason it went extinct was because it was brewed to death that's a stupid dad joke and hopefully you didn't believe that because I just made that up but this next part is true in the early 1890s the tooth and skull cap and thigh bone of an extinct human species were found by a team of archaeologists in East Java that's what gave this discovery the nickname Java man it was a big deal at the time as the bones at that point were the oldest known hominid ever discovered it was originally argued by some archaeologists that Java man was the ancestor of Homo erectus but there were some who said that it was the so-called missing link between ape and man. Coming in hot at number seven on this list is Homo Denisova. One of the more recent discoveries of an extinct human species was made in the Denisova cave in Siberia as recent as 2008. Only very few remains have been discovered so far, but thanks to advanced DNA analysis, it has been possible to sequence the genome of Homo Denisova. It has been possible to show that some people in Tibet have snippets of Denisovian DNA, the same way that some Europeans have tiny percentages of Neanderthal DNA. Coming in at number six, we're bringing you Pengu Man. He was made out of clay and his mother beats him with a frying pan while everyone in his life is extremely volatile. If you don't understand that reference, I feel very sorry for you. Another extinct human found in 2008 was Homo Cytungensis. If you can't say that name, just call him the catchier nickname Pengu Man. I struggle with that every single time. Pengu Man's fossilized mandible was discovered by fishermen working near Pengu Islands off the coast of Taiwan. It is extremely thick and has gigantic teeth which puzzled scientists for several reasons. They were like, how did a creature that didn't have access to a high carb diet and squats get so thick? I'm just kidding on that one. They have been able to determine that it was the mandible of a previously unknown species and that it was probably very similar to Homo erectus, but larger. It has so far not been possible to date this fossil, so they are not sure when the species was alive, but finding this incredibly strange fossil with very little to compare it to, it is clear that it doesn't exist anymore. Thankfully. We are at the halfway point of this list, and for number five, we are at Menisi Man. Homo georgicus, otherwise known as Menisi Man, is a species of extinct human which has been found in Menisi, Georgia. The species has a very small brain, unlike many of our extinct ancestors. The five skulls, which are evidence of Homo georgicus, were discovered in 1991, and since then they've been subject to much debate. They may have been an intermediary between Homo erectus and Homo habilis, but there are some scientists who think their skulls are simply examples of Homo erectus, despite having small brains brains, the fossils are associated with a total of 73 tools, which proves that a large brain is not always necessary to use tools. Although I would not want to be around the dude who has a small brain and a bunch of tools. He's either going to do a terrible job fixing your car, or he's going to be rooting around your insides before you have the chance to introduce yourself. Coming in at number four, we have the Red Deer Cave People, the most recently known archaic human to go extinct. The remains of the Red Deer Cave People have been dated approximately 11,500 years ago, meaning they were still around about 28,500 years after the last pure Neanderthal. Some scientists think the Red Deer cave people were a hybrid of Homo Denisova and modern humans, but attempts to sequence their DNA have not proved successful, so it's currently impossible to say for sure. We're finally down to the top three here of the most amazing top 10 list of scary extinct human species, and now we have Homo naledi. Evidence of Homo naledi was unearthed in 2013 in a cave in South Africa by cavers who were able to access a chamber in the Rising Star cave system for the very first time. 30 meters down or 98 feet below the surface, it's strewn with thousands of bones which have unique and interesting features, with 1,550 currently excavated and many more remaining in the cave. Some of their features are archaic and resembling specimens from 20 million years ago, but they also have more modern hominid features and their bones have been dated about 250,000 years ago. It has been concluded that they are not direct ancestors of modern humans. Coming in at number two on the list, we have The Hobbit. In 2004, researchers made an announcement that a discovery 
discovery had been made on the island of Flores, Indonesia. The people on the island had long talked about Ubu Gogo, a race of short-haired hairy men who lived in the caves. Astonishingly, the discovery of stone tools and the remains of a small hominid in the cave on the island seemed to prove the legend right. The official name was Homo floresiensis after the island, but they have become known as the Hobbit. Homo floresiensis was approximately 3.5 feet tall with large feet. The Hobbit had very primitive features and a small brain, like our earliest Australopithecan ancestors, but they were able to use tools and also may have been able to hunt and use fire. Using fire back then must have made you the biggest bad of all time. You could just wave it around and everyone would have thought you were a god, and they would have for sure thought you could just like dance really cool or something like that that would go along with the fire. And the moment you've all been waiting for, we are at number one on our list, and for number one, we have the Ghost Ancestor. A study published in 2019 has shared evidence of yet an undiscovered extinct human ancestor proposed after an AI program determined that there was a ghost population of archaic humans which interbred with modern humans in the distant past. Researchers think the unknown ancestor sister may have been an offshoot of Homo Denisova based on the evidence. With new techniques such as this and advances in fields such as DNA analysis, it is now possible to learn more about extinct species of human than ever before. New species are being discovered and identified with relative frequency, and the earliest discoveries can now be reassessed and analyzed with greater detail. The evidence is pointing not to one unbroken chain of human ancestors, but a rich family tree and a number of offshoots. Exactly how many extinct relatives we have will we will probably never know for sure, but with each discovery, we are able to add new unique pieces to the puzzle of who we are. But wait, that's not all that we have for you on today's top 10 list, guys. People living today who are in Europe, Asia, and Eurasia have well-defined Neanderthal-derived segments in their genome. These fragments are traces of interbreeding that followed the out-of-Africa human migration dating about 60,000 years ago. They imply that children born with Neanderthal modern human pairings outside of Africa were raised among the modern human and ultimately bred with other humans, explaining how bits of Neanderthal DNA remain in the human genome. The plot thickens. Are previous human species embedded within us somehow? Did we evolve from so-called extinct species that I just presented you with? If you weren't scared listening before, then you might be a little bit scared right now. Starting off this countdown, we have the Neanderthals. Turns out that humans used to get it on with Neanderthals. Back in the 90s, as researchers were studying the Neanderthal genome, they discovered something pretty odd. Specific genes of the Neanderthal look similar to human genes. They figured out that this is because humans and the Neanderthals were getting freaky together back then. In particular, men were getting it on with female Neanderthals. However, they believed that it was pretty rare for this to happen and it only happened sporadically. The mystery that remains is why. Was it to satisfy their impulses, or at one point were they capable of loving each other? In our ninth spot, we have New Grange. This is a prehistoric site built around 3100 BC. In fact, it is said to be the oldest and most famous prehistoric site in all of Ireland. Basically, it's this really weird round structure made out of wood, clay, and stone. The roof is covered in grass, and inside the structure is a long passage that leads to a cross-shaped chamber. A lot of detail went into this place. It's completely waterproof, and still to this day, and the entrance of the tomb was positioned in a way so that during the winter solstice, the sun would beat in through the opening and down the passage to light it up. Clever, right? Well, we still don't know who this was built for and why. Whoever it was, they had to have been pretty significant. Moving on to number eight, we have eating zebras. I mean, hey, I get it. Back then, you gotta eat whatever you got your hands on, including zebras. This was one of the more common animals that the early humans would hunt and kill. Now, how do we know for a fact that they ate zebras? Good question, my friend. Well, researchers found stone tool marks on zebra bones. The marks looked like they were made when the animal was being butchered up. So 2.6 million years ago, the early humans lived on a diet of zebras. In our seventh spot, we have Gobekli Tepe. Constructed over 11,000 years ago, this landmark located in southeastern Turkey was originally just thought to be the remains of an old cemetery. However, upon excavating the land, they discovered more than 200 pillars in about 20 circles. The pillars are around 20 feet tall and weigh up to 10 tons. Some of the pillars have animal shapes carved into them. And the site isn't even fully excavated yet. It's theorized that that could take another 50 years. That's how big it is. Now, here's the main mystery. 
This monument was built during a time when metal tools and pottery had not been developed yet. So how was this built, why was it built and what was it for? In our 6th spot we have the domesticated dogs. The story of how we got dogs as pets is actually quite a weird one. Turns out we domesticated them by complete accident, or so that's what scientists claim. Basically during the last ice age, ancient humans would give their meat scraps to dogs. This created a bond between the dogs and humans, as well as a sense of trust. They weren't all like, oh look how cute I just want one by my side 24 7. No, no, they were like, here my dude just eat my scraps. Oh we're friends now? Cool. Now you may be like, why the hell would they share their food? They would have competed against each other. Well humans can't only eat meat, so if they had some left over, they would share it. Eventually dogs realized that being by humans meant food, and that's how it all began. I'm just glad that it did because I'm a huge dog lover. Smash that like button if you are too. We are now at our 5th and halfway mark with Saxe Woman, it's the best I can say it. Located in Peru, the Saxe Woman is a series of strange stone walls made from 200 ton blocks of rock and limestone. Scientists originally believed that this structure was some sort of fortress, but now it's thought that it was used more symbolically. In fact, if you look at it from above, the walls seem to form the shape of a cougar head. Not only that, but close to the structure they actually found a bunch of underground catacombs and passageways. Is this somehow linked to this structure or is it just a coincidence? Now it was initially thought to be a fortress, but later on scientists were like, nah, no way. So the mystery is, why did they build this and for what purpose? Another mystery is how it was built. The stones fit together perfectly, in fact not even a sheet of paper can fit in between the gaps. How did they do this and how did they also transport those stones? Moving on to number 4 we have the pyramids. So let's take a trip back to ancient Egypt for a second. Back then the pharaohs ordered pyramids to be built as tombs for them when they passed away. It took thousands of men and years to build these pyramids. Apparently it took 100,000 men and 20 years to build the Great Pyramid of Giza. Pretty insane right? So we know that the Egyptians were one of the first civilizations to believe in the afterlife, so I guess they went all out to ensure that they got there. It's still pretty incredible to think about all the time and effort that went into building the pyramid, and then they only used it for the dead. On top of that, how did they decide what shape to make them, and why were they so big and intricate? Surely we have theories, but there's no way to 100% know the reasoning behind it. In our third spot we have the Karnic stones. Over in Karnic France there are thousands of standing stones that were placed there during the Neolithic period, about 12,000 years ago. There are 4 groups of these stones, they are then arranged in rows that spread over 4 kilometers. The taller stones are to the west and they get shorter as you follow them east. The big mystery is what the heck are these for? Why did the people back then create this structure? To this day, archaeologists don't know the significance behind these stones. Some say that they were burial site markers, kind of like a modern day headstone. Or maybe it was a place for a religious gathering. Or they were astronomical markers. We still don't know for sure though. Coming in at number 2, we have Teotihuacan. This was one of the world's largest cities back in 600 AD. It was believed to have held around 200,000 citizens. Here's the thing though. To this day, no one knows who built the city or what happened to its citizens. But after their disappearance, the Aztecs lived among the ruins of the city. They were oblivious to the city's original architects, but they did worship them. Like I said, this city is very mysterious. There were no royal tombs or artworks pointing at who their leaders were. So, like, that's weird. And in our number one spot today, we have the Roman dodecahedrons. This is a very mysterious ancient artifact that we don't know why it was built or what it was used for. There are actually a hundred of these weird objects that were found. They are typically made of either stone or bronze. They have 12 sides with a small circle on each and pegs sticking out from the connecting corners. Some say maybe it was a candle holder, but that seems pretty intricate and elaborate just to hold a candle. 
whereas others think it served as a religious or astrological item. But much like a bunch of the other stuff on this list, we don't know for sure, so it remains a big mystery. Coming at number 10, we have hunting patterns. Early humans had a lot of different techniques that they could use to make sure that they were the ones on top of every creature. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have been able to get to the point where we don't have to hunt anymore. And we're talking about cloning meat. Some of those factors were that humans can hunt in groups, that they can make weapons, and that they can throw spears over hands. All of these things were advantages over early hominids, but the most terrifying of all of them was the fact that early humans could run animals to death. A skill that humans have over other creatures is the ability to run long distances for extended periods of time. Other animals are much better sprinters, but something that separates us is the ability to run marathon lengths or longer. So a way humans would hunt would be to chase down its prey and have it sprint away while humans were just jogging. When the animal thinks it's safe, it might relax for a moment, but then it would see humans approaching again, so it would sprint away again. The prey would once again settle down and then see humans running from far away. Early humans would literally run its prey to exhaustion because most animals don't sweat, so they overheat, collapse, and then become food. This process would sometimes take days. And guys, make sure you hit that like button because it really helps us out. Coming in at number nine, we have eradicated all the competition. There used to be a bunch of other species of human-like animals. Like, I'm sure that many of you have heard of Neanderthals. There's some people who have Neanderthal DNA. So if there was a bunch of human-like beings that were walking around around the same time as us, how were we able to become the ones who came out on top? Well, one of the theories is that we were the best at warfare. All of the early Homo sapiens would go to war with the other species that were around them and they took everyone out. I mean, they had some advantages that the others didn't. For instance, there was suspicion that they had the ability to throw spears overhead, which used to be the deadliest form of attack. Other species didn't have the dexterity for this and that meant that they were easily wiped out and back then we took no prisoners. Coming in at number eight, we have they were fueled by meat. There's a lot of evidence that meat combined with fire was the deciding factor in seeing humans evolve to stronger beings. See, humans were eating meat before we were able to use fire in a controlled sense to cook it, but we were eating raw meat, and when you're eating tons of raw meat, there's a higher chance that you're going to consume bacteria and parasites. So eating meat wasn't the safest, and our bodies needed longer digestive systems to digest this meat safely. This costs more calories, which is a precious resource for early humans. Now, when we started cooking meat, it meant that we could eat more of it and evolve to have smaller digestive tracts and bigger brains. So early humans were meat machines that were hungry to cook and burn all of the breathing creatures around them. Coming at number seven, we have sucking it dry. Now, as much as meat was a valuable source, it was still hard to get at times and hunting was never easy. Hunter gatherers are thought to have gotten 80% of their calories from gathering, but the early humans that were in charge of scavenging the land to find food did find a way to get some protein into the diet and that was through bones. Scavenging would often bring back bones of dead animals and humans found out that cracking the bones open and sucking the marrow out of them was a great source of protein. Actually, it's believed that for a long time bone marrow was the main source of protein for early man. That is kind of a gruesome image to think of. A human cracking open the skull of another animal and sucking the marrow out of it like a gothic Capri Sun. But back then you didn't have the fine skills of a barbecue pit master. Sucking on some bones must have been delicious and a delicacy of its time. You would have to fight off other creatures just so you could taste that good, good marrow. Coming in at number six, we have rub some dirt on it. You know that old saying, rub some dirt on it. That's supposed to be a sign of grit, something that sounds ridiculous, something that won't actually do anything for you and will probably make you feel even worse than when you first got hurt. Well, it turns out it might actually help. It's thought that early humans would actually take clay and rub it on their open wounds to try and heal them. Now, this sounds Sounds crazy. Why on earth would they do something like that? Well, they didn't do it just because they didn't know that much about medicine. It turns out that rubbing clay on a wound actually has some pretty strong healing properties. It would not only help the wound heal, but it would keep out parasites and bugs and stop the smell from attracting predators. That's crazy when you think about it. Not the fact that it actually works, but the fact that the saying rub some dirt on it actually has some medical backing. What about our other sayings like easy come, easy go? What 
What does that even mean? Well, I know what it means, but does it mean something more? Coming in at number five, we have they had no homes. Early humans would travel around constantly. They were what's called a nomad. They had no home and nowhere to come back to every day. Could you imagine that life now? Every day you gotta find a new landlord and the next day you spend finding another landlord. In between that, you would stop at Burger King to eat and then move on because someone took your favorite spot. The reason for this was food. As we've already covered, the main source of food for early man was gathering and hunting. Both these things involve moving great distances to collect as much food as possible and chase down animals. Now, it wouldn't make sense to travel hundreds of miles away from your home to get food and then burn all those calories to get back. So you would just set up shop in a new place and keep going. But once we figured out agriculture, then we would grow food in one place and start breeding livestock. Then we started sitting down a lot more and hanging out for most of the day. Coming in at number four, we have we are evolving faster. Early humans were too slow. It took them five million years just to go from rocks to iPhone 12. If I were in charge of all of this, we would already have robots that we can go on dates with and junk food that is way healthier than salad. But for real, there are some scientists that not only believe we are still evolving, but we are evolving faster. We could in fact be evolving a hundred times faster than when we first discovered agriculture. This seems strange to me because it would seem that we don't need to evolve anymore because science is evolving for us, but that could be exactly why we're evolving at such a high pace. We are now exposing our body and ourselves to so many new things, new foods, new information, new chemicals, new climates. Some of us are even going into space. The body is now in hyperdrive just to try and keep up with everything we're putting it through. Coming in at number three, we have homo sapiens were creatures of love. I don't mean that in the sense that they were all about peace. No, not at all. We already covered how early humans might have gone out of their way to take out every other human-like thing on the planet, but they also went out of the way to mate with all the other human-like species. Many people today have traces of other species in their body, like Neanderthals or Homo erectus and many others. So it would seem that some of us would want war and the others just wanted love, man. Now, why did humans have such an open door policy when it came to procreation? Well, we still don't know that. And it might give another answer as to what happened to all these other species. They might have just been bred out of existence. There's a chance that Homo sapien DNA was just that strong. And these other dudes got pushed out just like how today blue eyes and red hair are starting to disappear. Coming in at number two, we have they would banish you. There is a ton of evidence that shows early humans were very social animals. Way before we even knew how to build fires to hang around, we were gathering in groups. I wonder what we used to hang around before fires and water coolers. Maybe it was like a pile of bones or really cool rock. But because humans have always been such social animals, being sent out on our own would have been one of the worst punishments that you could ever receive. This would put you at risk for several reasons. For one, it would strain your mental health. I know that seems like a silly thing to say for early man, but they would be able to feel the stress of being alone for a long time. This would put them at the risk of dying from other animals. You would have no one to look over your shoulder, and predators always look for the weak one that's separated from the pack. But this would also make it hard for you to get food. You would have to scavenge all by yourself and it would be extremely hard to hunt. And coming into the number one spot, we have the Age of Metals. There is a time in prehistory when early man discovered metal. This was pretty simple metal, but as you can imagine back then, this would have been like discovering the nuclear bomb. So there was a short period of time where there were certain tribes that had access to metal and other tribes were literally still using stone and sticks. Now, what do you think happened in that time? Do you think that they were nice and they went around showing everyone how to use these new metals so they could make the whole world a better place and we would one day all surf the internet? No way, Jose. During that time, there was massive bloodshed as tribes who had the edge knew what metal was and how to use it and they would use it to attack the more primitive tribes. I mean, every time there's a technological advancement today, the same thing happens. We live in a time now where if you get hurt or sick, you can walk down to the doctor 
doctor and then they'll patch you up as good as new. Well, it depends on how much you take care of your body. If you get a stomach ache and then the doctor gives you something to feel better, but then you go home and keep eating Doritos, your body isn't really going to heal, but you'll still be better off than early humans were. Back then, if you sprained your ankle, they would leave you on a rock to get eaten by a saber toothed tiger. There would have been no comeback story. It was one and done. In fact, the life expectancy for early humans was somewhere in their late 30s. That means you had to get your life together fast. I might have already been an elder in my tribe or almost dead by the time I reached this stage of my life. I would probably be walking with a limp and too weak to fight. It wouldn't be long before I'd be sentenced to death by being left behind like the third dude on the sidewalk. And there would be good reason for this. If it wasn't an injury that would get you, it would be some sort of insect or infection. There was a little chance that you would be able to avoid the many things in the prehistoric world that would be trying to kill you at all times. In our number nine spot today, we have the Venus of Willendorf. If you've never heard of it before, the Venus of Willendorf is a small figurine that is said to have been made around 30,000 years ago, and it was one of the first cultural items that was found from the Paleolithic era. This specific figurine is similar to others that have been found from the same era as well, but this specific one was found during an excavation in 1908. These figurines are depictions of a nude female body, but there are most definitely some exaggerations. Some researchers believe that these figurines may have been a representation of a mother goddess and would be used as a symbolic fertility totem, but some people believe that these figurines were more of a form of erotic art. There is, however, one more theory about these figurines. It is believed by some that they were created by female artists who were looking down on their bodies. This theory says that this would be the reason there wouldn't be a face included on the figurine, as there were no mirrors for them to clearly see their own reflection. Coming in at number eight, we have crossover episode. Early humans were very territorial creatures, but they weren't dumb. Well, they weren't dumb compared to the creatures that were around back then. If we were to introduce them to today's society, they wouldn't be giving a lecture on the simple ways of hunting and gathering. What I mean by they weren't dumb is that they understood that they were much weaker than a lot of the other creatures that were around them, and they would need to work together if they wanted to take them down for food. This meant that they would often encounter other humans while they would be walking around and hunting, and instead of instantly getting into a fight over the hunting territory, they would join forces to wage war on larger edible mammals. Their communications would have been very basic. They probably were mainly using body language and a very simple system of grunts to get their point across, which isn't hard to believe. If you've ever been traveling, then you know you can find a way to talk to people without any sort of common tongue. Now this would be terrible for all the animals in the area. You would now have a team up of prehistoric Avengers. In our number seven spot today, we have extracurriculars. There are illicit substances that have been made by humans, but there are also some that are naturally occurring from nature and our earth. In today's world, drugs are a pretty controversial topic, regardless of the source that they come from, but looking back at our early human ancestors, these things were certainly not as complicated as they are now. There's evidence that has shown researchers that early humans were inhaling drugs before drugs was even a word. There's evidence that they would inhale hallucinogenic smoke through bowls and tubes that they created themselves, which would be used to send them into spiritual trances. Of course, this practice has become more taboo in our modern society, but there certainly is something to be said for how far back these practices date. I have a lot of questions as to how the early humans discovered these things in the first place, but I guess most of their time was spent discovering new things, which is honestly pretty cool. I also want to know how the first human who ever tripped out reacted. There is also apparently evidence that shows that the early humans also created their own alcohol. There is a site in Cyprus that dates back 11,000 years ago that researchers believe was used as a ceremonial site and also as a kind of prehistoric brewery. Coming in at number six, we have more hunting patterns. We talked about in part one of this list how some early humans would hunt. They would use their marathon running ability to literally run animals to exhaustion, having a beast sprint until it couldn't run any further and then drop down dead. But that wasn't the only way they were able to bring death to all the animals and creatures around them. A very popular form of hunting was just being the sneakiest dude in town, hiding in the bushes for hours until some unsuspecting animal got too close. You would then jump 
out and drive your spear through its head and bring it to the ground. This hunting technique could have been performed by small groups of hunters, but if you wanted to bring down something bigger, well then it was going to take a tactic that might have been a little more brutal. It was thought that early humans would chase things down like woolly mammoths and push them to the edge of a cliff. A group of them would then pressure the animal until it got scared and tumbled to its death. You could then go to where the creature fell down and it would be bon appetit. We have the waiting game. I know we've talked about hunting a few times, but this is just another one of those sneaky guy hunting methods that used to be used thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, hunting larger animals and prey has become significantly easier as we have high powered machines that allow us to take out animals that are much, much larger than us. But of course, this wasn't always the case. You know the phrase, work smarter, not harder? Well, early humans had that down as they would hide away, waiting for some form of a large predator to come and take down a prey that would be too big for humans to conquer. After this, they would wait for the large predator to leave, which is when they would go and scavenge the remains of the animal for food. This certainly wasn't the most common hunting tactic as humans had different taste preferences than, let's say, a lion. Like, a lion doesn't really care what age their prey is, but it has apparently been shown that early humans preferred their meat to have have been in their prime of adulthood before becoming their meal. But hey, beggars can't be choosers. Coming in at number four, we have cancer was still a problem. We like to think that one of the biggest killers of modern man is something that is new and it's been brought on by our overindulgence in chemicals and from having extremely poor diets. Did you know that eating fried food leaves your body more inflamed than smoking a cigarette? That's pretty wild. But back to my point, even though some of our modern tendencies have exacerbated how much cancer we are seeing develop in people, that doesn't mean that the disease is brand new. An archaeological dig in Kenya showed that early humans had lumps in their bodies that were most likely cancer tumors. There would have been no way to fight this back then, and it would have probably led to death in every case. In our number three spot today, we have the tattooed mummy. If mummies are something you're into, that's a little weird, but you may have also heard of Otzi the Iceman. Otzi was found in the Alps and is the earliest natural human mummy ever found in Europe, which is actually kind of cool. I mean, maybe not for Otzi, but it's an interesting fact for sure. Anyways, there was of course a lot of research done on him after his discovery, and one thing that was very notable was the fact that he had a total of 61 tattoos on his body. That is probably not anything crazy for us today, but all things considered, this was a lot of tattoos for someone during the time that he lived in. Most of the tattoos were difficult to see at first, which seems pretty fair considering the fact that he lived thousands and thousands of years ago, and the fact that his body is now mummified. While the idea of him having tattoos is certainly very interesting, researchers believe that the tattoos were actually done as an attempt at pain relief. Sort of like a prehistoric version of acupuncture that used fireplace ash. It's honestly kind of sad to think of him as being in pain so often that he needed 61 different tattoos, all of which were gone over multiple times on different occasions. Coming in at number two, we have climate change forced innovation. Seeing the beast of climate change that is coming over the horizon makes you wonder if we're going to be able to beat it and strive to be alive another day. Are we going to be able to come up with a way to best the biggest threat that we have seen in recent years? I think we will. Honestly, I think I'm going to change so little about my lifestyle that I won't even notice that there was a change when the world is just fixed. That's what happens with most of my problems. And if history is right, then that's exactly how things should play out. It would seem that climate change has been something that our ancestors have faced before, and every time they've come up with a new an innovative way to combat these changes and survive. So we just gotta pull it off one more time and we're good, baby. And in our number one spot today, we have these prehistoric medical practices. There's never been a great time in history to be in need of medical attention, but from my limited medical knowledge and all the medical advancements we have made, I feel like now is probably a better time than the rest of history. This, however, has of course not stopped people from seeking out medical attention because because of course, you have to at least try. Well, as it turns out, there's actually some pretty interesting evidence suggesting the ways that some early humans gave themselves stitches, as well as some evidence on some form of prehistoric brain surgery, if you can believe that. Trepanation is a procedure that involves forming holes in the human skull. This is definitely a thing that was quite common among early humans, but it is highly debated why. Some researchers believe that it was a spiritual practice, but some 
swear that it was a form of brain surgery. In terms of stitches that were used by early humans, this is a fact that really grosses me out, and it unfortunately involves ants. People would hold an ant above their open wound and wait for the ant to bite the wound with its pincers. After the ant grabbed on, they would then remove the head of the ant so that the pincers would stay in place like a stitch. Honestly, after reading this, I really hope that this was one of the times that the internet was lying to me, and if it's not, I feel incredibly grateful that today's version of stitches doesn't involve bugs. Mm -hmm.